Kia ora. It's good to see you here to see the video. And although it's a freshwater tank, today it's all about the sea. Because today I want to see rocks get positioned. I want to see water go in. I want to see plants go in. I want to see the pumps working. And I want to see the overall effect of the river. So before we jump in, let's just jump back a little bit and talk about the method that I've used to build up that substrate. Now, this is a budget build. It's not what I would have preferred to have done. What I would have liked to have done is created three levels that I've got at the moment. The first level being the uh, pumice bags, then you've got the gravel bricks, and then you've got the polystyrene box. So it's basically three levels. And I would have liked to have created those with uh, acrylic. It would have been quite easy to do. Uh, just set in some cardboard boxes or cut out some cardboard to get the overall heights and then transfer them to a sheet of acrylic and either make uh, three little boxes to represent the three steps or do it all out of one. Now if I did it that way I'd still have sand going around three sides and on the side facing into the tank to the left I would have drilled a lot of holes for water circulation and on the top and I could even put a bubbler in there to uh, help with the water flow because you don't want water going bad and I would have also on the far side cut in a uh, reasonable sized hole so fish could swim into that area now you wouldn't see them do that that would be hidden from view but it would uh, make the tank more stable because there's more water volume Having fish swimming into the acrylic structure wouldn't cause a problem. Um, I'm intending on using small fish, and even if one did die in there, there shouldn't be an ammonia spike, as the filter would easily handle that. Acrylic is very easy to work with, uh, cutting it, uh, drilling holes, and uh, gluing it together with silicon. The advantage being, it's very light, compared to what I've done at the moment, which uh, has a reasonable weight to it. In fact, those bottles that contain sand, I would have preferred to put pumice in there, uh, but I ran out, so I had to make do with what I've got. You will notice those little grey, one, two, three, four, five, octagonal sided, um, what would you call them, grids. They are actually a commercial product to hold gravel or stones in a driveway, so they're ideal for this sort of situation, and I'm going to use these to give some more height to the rock. With the present method, probably about a, a fifth of the water volume has been lost due to my substrate. Anyway, I'll save some dollars doing it the way I'm doing it. It's a pity I didn't have some different texture or coloured sand, so I could just mix in some different layers as I built up the sand in the front to give the effect of a rammed earth wall or a roadside cutting through a hill where you see the different stratas. It'll just make it more interesting. I need to stop the stump from floating. This is where we're at. We've finished the subbed, ready for the final layer of the display rocks. I've made space there for two plants, possibly. I've kept the uh, aerator, a bubbler, largely uncovered. There will be big stones across the top, but hopefully we'll be able to get some small bubbles. If I cover it with these smaller stones, the air that does come out will be generally larger bubbles. But I've no idea what the weight is, and hopefully that 
polystyrene's not going to lift. I used all of my larger rocks and just basically spread them down the slope. And I really could have done with a few more big rocks. Now to start the monsoon rains. There's no sign of the tree stump lifting or that polystyrene. Alright, got to steal some stuff from this one. Now, what am I going to keep in there? I'm going to have a go at keeping hill stream loaches. Uh, I did try them in the past with not much success. The temperature just gets too warm during summer. But we're going into winter now and I'm hoping that uh, if I can provide them with really rich oxygenated water and a steady flow that they might be able to adapt enough to get through the summer. These fish are what I'll call subtropical. They prefer a temperature range of 68 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 20 to 24 degrees Celsius. So I'll set this tank at 21 degrees. Let's go to the local stream. Well, there's plenty of Elodia growing in that stream. And down here, we've got some hydrocotyl type plant. A little bit more over there. Well, time for me to get muddy feet and do some harvesting. We've got some Elodia, possibly Hydrocotyl. So we'll get some Elodia set up and put it into this little basket. stay in there? Probably not. So I just put a lead weight around there. It's just a bit of an experiment. We'll see what happens. Easy enough to fix. And it's going to go into that little pot like so and then uh, find the rock. Where can I find a rock? Oh, there's a rock. Gotta get the right shape on. Maybe I need more rocks. And I can do the same in this little space. I 
I'd also purchased some hair grass, uh, not the dwarf variety, and I couldn't get hold of any short valisneria, so settled on some jungle val. Plus, I've got some dwarf Sagittarius, which is melting badly. As a feature, a crypt balance. In the sand area on the left hand side I planted my dwarf sag in the middle. It wasn't really looking that healthy, so I'm not too sure if that'll survive. And along the back and along the side, my jungle valve. I separated the hair grass into smaller pieces and planted those along the front. The leaves on the Cryptolanthe will melt anyway, so I cut those off and trim the roots. Hopefully all the vigour of the plant will be into new growth. I planted it on its own, so hopefully it'll become a feature. And I'll have to watch that jungle valley, it'll try to take over the whole tank. Ah, some dwarf sedge trying to escape. Okay, now to fit these java ferns and the holes that I pre-drilled into the stump. Might need a bit of gentle persuasion. I don't want to go in there. I don't want to. I don't want to go in there, I said. Why won't you listen to me? I'm not going in there. It's so small. I'm a big plant. I don't want to go in that little small place. Don't push, you're hurting. Ah. <sighs> And I need to add another piece of driftwood with java fern, just to block this area on the right. Presently you can sort of see the sponges and things from the filters in the background, but hopefully I can hide most of that. If all goes well, the elodia will grow into this area. These two branches, that's all I could fit in from the big tree that I prepared in my earlier video. I need to look at the options for getting some water current flowing over these rocks. For a start I've got two power heads so I'll get those installed. Here we have one power head going, not much flow. Now we've got the two power heads going and there is more flow.
But wait, there's still more. We've got the two power heads going and the hang on back filter. Not a huge increase, but there is definitely a good flow. And in this shot, we've got the hang on back operating by itself. Not that impressive, but you do have to remember that as the water is flying across the front of the tank, the area it's flying into is getting bigger, therefore the force is dissipated. Now we can't forget that little fluval pump that we installed in the last video. As expected, it's not really doing a great job. To enable me to have the tank fully cycled, I've reinstated the trickle filter that was on the large community tank and stolen the small canister filter, which I've connected to the river tank. It's not a high flow canister, but I'll be leaving it in place as it will help remove some of this pumice dust from the water. Oh, it's a quarry. It's two. Well, we've jumped ahead a few days here. Uh, the water is still cloudy and um, I'm doing a partial water change each morning. But it's going to take a few days before that dust gets waterlogged and settles. So the two quarries came from my nano tank along with the minnows. I've got a total of six minnows. I've got four white cloud minnows and two golden white cloud. The quarries well, they're just visitors for the time being. Looks like there's signs of melting already, it's losing its colour. I'll probably need to put uh, a couple of bright lights on here and see if that's enough to help it bounce back quickly. That's probably especially important for the Elodia, uh, which has come out of direct sunshine. So these flickering lights are both 20 watts, certainly a lot brighter. That might be just enough to help boost a bit of life in these plants. Right, what I've tried to do is to uh, stop this area receiving the water from the main stream because it's creating a backwash and basically slowing the flow. So over here we've got main power head coming up that then meets the water coming from the filter to help divert it around this corner.
Wow, I've got weeds growing already. They grew fast. And it's a foggy morning. Actually, I think that's a good sign but because it means that the water is circulating into the deep bed areas of the tank. So I shouldn't get any dead spots. Okay, I've done a partial water change. It's an improvement. It's probably something I need to do for several days in a row just to really get on top of this then we should have crystal clear water. I made an interesting observation while pushing plants into the ground with tweezers. Sand particles were attaching to the tweezers when they were removed from the sand. Now some tools such as tweezers and pliers are magnetised to assist getting small items in hard to get places. I tested these tweezers and could not find any trace of them being magnetised. In further testing, I was able to reproduce these sand grabbing effect. Could it be static electricity? Or did the bog iron that we collected during video 2 have something to do with it? Now also, when I adjusted the filter, I dislodged the heater and it touched the sand overnight. I repositioned it the following morning, but noticed it was heavily marked for such a new heater. Now similar scaling can occur with heaters over longer time periods, but I've not known it to be so quick. Could this be electrolysis or galvanic action that we discussed during video 2? I had sand and potting mix left over from this project, so I used it in one of my nano tanks, which was already without fish and missing the java fern and driftwood. Here I was able to reproduce the magnetic effect, so I have concluded that the sand actually contains iron particles, possibly magnetic. Now this is not unusual as in New Zealand we have many areas of iron sand, and this iron sand is not a problem for fish or plants, but there is an inherent danger with it, as these particles can get into a filter or power head and stick to the armature severely wearing out the impeller. Something I need to be aware of when I place my power heads and filters. So how many power heads and filters am I actually using? One canister filter, two power heads, a hang on back filter and an old worn out fluval water pump. South Island of New Zealand has many braided river systems where the grey wacky rocks, similar to what I'm using, get carried from the Southern Alps down to the Pacific Ocean and during their journey they get worn smooth and smaller. It is often said that more water flows below the riverbed than above it and that's a situation that I've got with my river system. All the water is coming in at the top but most of it is going through the rocks and dispersing. As it stands I've got three things to sort out. One, should I take out all of these small pumps and put in one large unit that can push through, say, 2,000 litres per hour? Two, will the fish that I've already ordered, and of a type that I've never seen before, be suitable for this tank? Three, will my water ever clear? Well, I guess I know by this time next week. Hope to catch you then. Bye.